Welcome back to Common Sense Psychology. We're just really happy today that you've come to join us and share a part of your day with us. Welcome, Lois. We're just really happy to have you back <coughs> again as our, as our hostess here. Um, we'd like to um, take this opportunity to just say that we have been holding classes on biblical psychology. This is the fourth in our series, and uh, we've been talking about the problem that, that man has problem that God has to deal with and um, how biblically we, we want to be a part of that solution. Lois, I'd just like to again start with prayer this morning and uh, ask if you'd be willing to pray for us today. <clears throat> Our loving Father, we're so thankful that you have given your son. Amen. We know that without that you would have not been able to tell us anything as far as our cooperation with you in extricating ourselves from our bondage. Now, Father, we praise Thee for giving Jesus, and we praise Him for giving His life willingly for us. And we praise the Holy Spirit for making the entire program workable for us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now we pray that You will be with us this afternoon as we talk about this important subject of a proper relationship with Thee. Give us insight, give us wisdom, because You promised if we ask it, You'll give it. And we do ask it in the name of Jesus, who died for us. Amen. Amen. Well, Lois, maybe you'd like to just recap for our viewers who perhaps <coughs> haven't been with us, uh, just a little bit about what we've talked about in the last three weeks together. Uh, briefly, uh, we have discussed the dilemma that God was in and the sin principle coming into this world and how he has come up with a solution to it and how we are to cooperate with him because everything depends on the right action of the human will. If, if the human will does not um, cooperate with God in this program, we will remain lost. And this is why everything does depend on the right action of the will, even in our being born again. We, the current of eternal life was disconnected and when that happened, Satan took control of our will. And your little design up there uh, gives us a graphic picture of what happened at creation. God was communicating to man via the will. And when Satan got a disobedience from Adam and Eve, the will was taken captive and he uses the mind organ of desire to dictate our kind of decision making. And our decisions, as, as we're under the control of Satan, results in nothing but misery and ruin to us. So God t tells us how to do what needs to be done and he says, take the will from the control of Satan and give it to me and I will take possession of it and then I can work in you to will and to do of my good pleasure but that's always for your good. So we're <clears throat> we find ourselves in that predicament and we have to be born again and in connection with that we're going to review a statement that the true principles of psychology are found in the Holy Scriptures and we're going to think about how God has been attempting to t give us messages. He uses our human experiences and our human relationships to help us to understand the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us. <clears throat> so he has been using the father-child relationship. He's our father, we're his children. We know that because we have children, fathers have children. The mother-child relationship, can a mother forget her sucking child? Yes, she may, but I'll never forget you. He uses the friend-friend relationship in the case of Jonathan and David to represent his devotion to us. Um, Jonathan said that his love surpassed the love of woman, the way he felt mm -hmm. toward David, the, the experience he had. And then he uses probably the most delightful of human experiences, the experience of husband and wife, to illustrate the kind of relationship he wants to have with us. Well, as I think on these relationships, <coughs> I think how important it is for us as parents to rightly represent God to our children. There's a, a statement that Mrs. White makes to that effect that 
uh, that's what we're doing as we live with our children. We're showing God what, or it's our children what God is like. And if we're unjust or if we're inconsistent, they get an image of God as being unjust or inconsistent. That's true. That is very true. Now, <clears throat> in continuing this particular section, I would like for us to see how God uses <clears throat> the human experience of birth and death and marriage. So we're going to start with the human experience of birth and death and show how Paul is using that to illustrate a, an experience that we have in psychologically being converted. So I'm going to ask you to read Romans 6, 13, uh, pardon me, Romans 6, 3 to 14. And notice the analogy between death, life, and resurrection. Okay, starting with verse 3. Mm -hmm. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Wonderful. Beautiful promises. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, we should not serve sin. May I interject something here? Um, working in the prison, the women never referred to their husbands as anything but my old man. Oh, really? Yeah. It's kind of graphic when mm -hmm. I think about it. And knowing this, that our old man, our carnal nature, mm -hmm. is crucified with him. <clears throat> this is what happens at the conversion state. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. <clears throat> For he that is dead is freed from sin. I love that. Right. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Mm -hmm. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now that mortal body, I think, is the human nature. <clears throat> Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. What would the members be? Well, I imagine in, in the oh, terms that you're body. talking about, you're talking about the body and the, mm -hmm. the mind faculties. Um, <clears throat> but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now this is talking about conversion. Mm -hmm. It gives us a psychological glimpse of what really happens at conversion, that sin no longer reigns over us, it no longer rules us. <clears throat> now we go from that analogy to the human relationship of husband and wife, and we're going to read Romans 7, 1 to 4, and I will read this because Paul is talking to the Romans, and I think he's talking about the Roman law, but it really doesn't matter which law he's mm -hmm. talking about. But we're going to read now, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he lives. And I had this come really clear to me in working with people who were convicted of being under the law. They had transgressed the law and they became under the law and they were sentenced to prison. If they died while they were in prison, they were no longer under that law. That's they true. were freed from it. But if a man committed murder, we'll say, and was confined to county jail waiting for sentence, and he died, he was guilty, but he died, the case would be dropped. And so only the people that are alive are under the law. <clears throat> For I speak to them that know the law, that how that the law hath, no, hath dominion over a man only as long as he lives. And then he goes ahead, he's giving us a spiritual lesson here, but it is psychological. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So this is telling me that the law of the Romans provided that a woman could not remarry. 
She could not marry anyone else as long as her original husband lived. And that didn't, it didn't really matter whether he was in the insane asylum or if he was in far regions of the world, never meant to come back. She was still bound to him as long as he lived. And so Paul is using this natural law that was existing at that time to illustrate a spiritual truth. <clears throat> so then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Who would that be, Jackie? Well, Christ. Yes, every child would know that yes. the one who was raised from the dead, if he knows anything about scripture or religion, would know that the new husband is Jesus Christ. Now, the message here is that our old husband is dead. Would that be the carnal mind, do you think? Hmm. You know, I think this whole um, talk about marriage is so special mm -hmm. because Christ did mean, when he called us his bride, all the way through the scriptures. That's right. Never the calls us his old lady. Or no, no. The church was his bride. Right. And he means for that relationship to, a husband and wife relationship, to represent his relationship, his longing love for mm -hmm. his church. How unfortunate that we don't always represent it correctly, but oh, that was what he yes. was <clears throat> what we were meant to do, and that was why we had the marriage relationship in the first place, mm -hmm. was to represent to the universe the love relationship between God and his created beings. Mm -hmm. So here we have a spiritual truth, a psychological message that our old carnal nature has to die in order for mm -hmm. us to be married to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is never going to enter into an adulterous relationship mm -hmm. with us. As long as our other husband is alive, he's not going to share the marriage bed with him. So we go back to <clears throat> the fact then that our will is either with one or the other. It's exactly. either with God or mm -hmm. it's with Satan. It can't be... And our affections. Right, exactly. <clears throat> and everything we are. Right. So we, we get the, uh, the concept here that there is something that dies and must die before mm -hmm. we can enter into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And when I, you were mentioning about wooing a while ago, mm -hmm. a long wooing process, well, I often think about when Jesus Christ attempted to get my attention. It was while I was still married to the old man. And I... By old man, you don't mean your husband. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I don't call my husband my old man. But, but anyway, it's kind of a human um, experience and uh, attitude that uh, really gives weight to this mm -hmm. because the, the old man there's an element of disrespect there and and truly he deserves right. disrespect <clears throat> but uh, paul is here telling us that he wants to marry us and he woos us as uh, we would be able to understand when we anticipate a romantic relationship mm -hmm. and as he began wooing me i would think he couldn't be interested in me because I've done so many things. He wouldn't want to be even attracting my attention. I've been so evil. And then I think of all of the things that I might have done, and that is I might be a drug addict or I might be an alcoholic or I might even be a prostitute. Lots of the women were in, involved in prostitution in order to support their drug habit. Mm -hmm. So I might have even done that. And <clears throat> There are any, any number of things that I'm probably guilty of. If not by actual commission, then the possibility of committing these crimes is always there. So I felt like I should tell him, but Lord, you don't know what I've been doing. You wouldn't want me for a wife. And you know, he said, oh yes, I know what you've been doing. I know everything that has happened to you, <clears throat> even, er, even before you were born. I know how come you were born with a carnal nature. I know how it happened that you have been doing things that were not right. And I love you anyway. I love you exactly the way you are. I think that's special. I remember as a child, the people in my life that God, I think, used to show me what he was like. And I hope someday to meet some of those people in heaven mm -hmm. so I can thank them because as a child, I, d I obviously didn't appreciate uh, the part they were playing in my salvation. 
Right. And God was using them, working through them, my mother, to my father. To reveal his love. But also mm -hmm. friends mm -hmm. and uh, parents of, of some of my friends and True. so on, ministers. Mm -hmm. And he was using all of them. Absolutely. So finally I decide, uh, yes, I think that I can risk marrying this man. And so I say, all right, so the courtship is over and the engagement begins and we're waiting for the marriage and all of a sudden I think, oh dear, he's not going to want to marry me because I'm not going to be able to be perfect. Hmm. I'm not going to be able to live up to his expectations. I'm still probably going to lose my temper at times and I'm still probably going to have some debasing appetites and I don't really believe that he's going to put up with that. So I tell him, Lord, I don't think you want to marry me because I'm not going to be able to live up to your expectations. And do you know what he says? He said, I know it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't matter because I'm going to change all of your corrupted appetites. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help you overcome every single habit that you have that is not in agreement with my will for you. I'll take responsibility to changing everything that needs to be changed about you. And he's so convincing. Then I finally say, great let's be married and then i am converted i am bad i show by by baptism which is the spiritual um, representation of the marriage ceremony and i arise to newness of life with him and the relationship with him begins so what you're really saying i think is that god starts where we are mm -hmm. when we come to him he accepts us as we are and says now exactly. let's grow together from mm -hmm. here he doesn't expect us to stay put. Right. If, if someone is a, a drug user, let's say, he doesn't expect them to continue in that sin. No, he doesn't. But he provides the power to change the and life. This is what he finally convinced me of, mm -hmm. that there was power to be an overcomer and to live up to his expectations by his grace. Mm -hmm. And the relationship then becomes even more enchanting and romantic than any earthly relationship mm -hmm. that I can even imagine. Can you imagine how Jesus feels being a second husband? <laughs> you know, I have thought so often of all the, all the ways that we hurt him. Yeah. And his long suffering with us because he's our creator. He deserves yeah. the absolute um, love and, and return of the love he gives us. He deserves our attention and our adoration Absolutely. and our glorification, everything. And, and we just kind of act like he's there and we take him for granted. Mm -hmm. And how that must hurt. It hurts when my children do that to yeah. me. And he's God after all. You know, I think if I were facing a second marriage in real life, I would be kind of apprehensive that my second husband would be curious about what happened when I was married to the old man, to the other, other mm -hmm. husband. And I would be concerned. But you know, Jesus never does throw up what happened mm -hmm. in the old relationship. Wouldn't you like to have a second husband like that? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't care what happened when we were married to the old man. So anyway, that kind of gives us a little glimpse into the, the beauty of the relationship. And it, it transcends even the, uh, the scientific aspect of what changes are made in our conversion, that we begin then a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul then, enters into a married relationship with Jesus Christ. And this is what he's talking about there. And he's saying, brethren, you do that too. Mm -hmm. And then he continues and he says later, and I'm assuming that he was already married to the Lord Jesus Christ when he says in Romans 7, beginning with verse 14. Would you read those verses down to the end of the chapter? <clears throat> For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, let me ask you a question there, Jackie. Could the carnal mind do that, that you consent unto the law that it is good? The carnal mind is at enmity. It is not subject to the law of God, no. neither indeed can be. Mm -mm. So there's a big controversy over whether Paul is really converted or not. But there is a statement in the early Ellen G. White uh, material that says Paul was a converted mm -hmm. man when he said this. Mm -hmm. But anyway, 
there is that argument that because Paul says, but I am carnal, sold under sin, and I looked up that word carnal, and it, ha it pertains to the human nature. Mm -hmm. So it is speaking of the carnalized human mm -hmm. nature. And we will be talking more about that next right. week. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Right. In other words, my, it's not the real me, the, the me no. that has put my will with God, yes. that has yielded my will up to God. That's the real me. It's not that one. It's the other guy. Okay, go ahead. It'll clear it up in just a For minute. I know <laughs> that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Carnalized human nature. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Okay, now is he converted? Of course. He delights in the law yes. of God after the inward man, but go ahead. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Okay, now let's stop there. He sees another law in his members, warring against the law of his mind. I'd like for us to conceptualize that the, the base of the brain is right here, mm -hmm. from our eyebrow, eyebrows back. Mm -hmm. So the law of my mind is from here up, and the law of my members is from here down. And I, I guess when I picture myself, I picture myself as the real me is from here up, because right. that's where my will is. That's exactly right. And the rest of it is a product of, of my the genetic uh -huh. background, the environment I was raised in, the habit patterns that have been developed over time and but this this is the real me up here that's right and i think that's our power over sin is when we realize that mm -hmm. this is the real me and there will be victory because the law of my mind is warring against the law of my members go ahead bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members O wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from the body of this staff I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'd like to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my new husband. That's a neat way to look at it. <laughs> okay. So then with the mind, then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of the sin. human nature, uh -huh. the law of sin. But even that doesn't continue indefinitely. No. There is victory no. over that. But only as we... <clears throat> as we talked about before, tap into that reservoir of God's grace. Absolutely. His power, His mm -hmm. perfect character. Now, I, I want us to think for just a minute or two about the illustration of this relationship that we're talking about that God gave us in the Old Testament. And He gave us this illustration in the story of Hosea, who was a prophet of God. Mm -hmm. And according to the record, Hosea was instructed by God to marry a prostitute. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, all of us are prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have been idolatrous people, mm -hmm. and idolatry is spiritual adultery, mm -hmm. so we are spiritual prostitutes. Mm -hmm. So Hosea was told <coughs> to go and marry a prostitute, and he did. <coughs> he took Gomer to be his bride, and she bore him three children. And I don't know whether she got tired of doing diapers and dishes or what <laughs> happened, but she made a decision that she wanted to go back into her old life of prostitution. This tells me that we can always go back yeah. into the old life of prostitution. But another thing this tells me is that God does not divorce us, even if we do, because Gomer did, <coughs> did go back into her old profession. It also tells me something else about God, and that is, again, how highly he values that freedom of choice. Oh, yes, and how, how highly he values people, mm -hmm. too. Yeah because uh, Hosea evidently was not even inclined to divorce Gomer. Mm -hmm. He loved her anyway. And that is his amazing grace. I don't know how he could do it. You know, humanly, we don't live up to that kind of love. But anyway, she went back into prostitution. I don't know how long she was in it, but long enough to lose her beauty and her ability to make a living. When people could not make a living in those days, they were sold at auction as slaves. And so, Hosea heard by some means, I don't know whether he read the morning newspaper or it was word of mouth or what, but he heard that his wife was going to be sold at auction. Do you know what he did? He went and bought her back. That's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. 
paid the, pr paid the price for her, took her home, not as his slave, but as his bride. I think of the, of the <coughs> story of Abraham mm -hmm. and Isaac on the mountaintop and how God meant that to be an illustration of the sacrifice that he and his son were to make, right. as Isaac and Abraham did. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also a story of showing his us great love. more about our God Yes, and so, his relationship to <coughs> us. You know, Lois, in the, in the little bit of time we have left here, I, I, I just really think it's important that we stress the importance of our relationship with God. Because these stories, that's what they tell us, is about how much God loves us and right. what lengths he's gone to mm -hmm. to have us be converted, to come put our will back in his control, and to purify our lives. Right. And how he's that, bought us with his own blood, yes. you know, that auction. <laughs> and it's that relationship that my salvation mm -hmm. rides on. Right. And day by day, minute by minute, it seems like it's... it's we practice his presence. You know, I think every day it's important we're sure of our salvation. Oh, absolutely. And we can only be sure of that if we have an ongoing relationship with God. Yesterday's is an ex experience isn't good for today or last week's or last month. It isn't, it, I've got to have a relationship today with God. I have to have my will in his control today, minute by minute by minute. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> as I do that, then I can be sure of our salvation and, and of my salvation. And I think when Mrs. White talks about that, um, she's, she's telling us, you know, not that we go out and, in a phony way or a, uh, a way that maybe... Self-righteous way. Yeah, <coughs> a self-righteous way. Mm -hmm. um, but in a, in a quiet calm, I need, if I'm going to have peace in my life, mm -hmm. to know that everything's okay between God and I. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, then I then need to, to clear that up at that right. moment of recognition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though this sounds a little bit like once saved, all the way saved, the side that we're, once, that we're saved always is on God's side. We can always go back. Yes. <clears throat> we still have freedom of choice. I know that God means for us all to be saved. That's what the cross was all about. Right. And that's <clears throat> the beauty of our Lord. He mm -hmm. wants us all with him for eternity. We're just really happy that you chose to join us for a part of your day today. And we're looking forward to next week when we'll be talking about the psychology of sanctification. Um, you'll notice on your screen that we have the address of Common Sense Psychology. If you would like to contact us and ask questions about some of these programs or maybe get further information uh, to help you as you live your daily life, we would encourage you to write to us in California. And again, have a happy day and a blessed week.